Hello, and in this video I'm going to talk about masks that sounded really good in the design phase and then when they were actually made turned out to be a bit awful. So what I have here, um, comedi comedically hanging from me, as you can see they're absolutely gigantic, is the M10M and the Scott GSR. But the M10M is basically in this video just going to refer to all M17 style cheek filter masks. And I know I've talked about cheek filter masks a lot, but this video might be quite interesting to some people. Because this is basically kind of showing you how on paper something can be great, and then when you come to make it, you kind of cut corners and the masks aren't so great. So, let's first get out the M10M. So, as you can see, that's this mask. It's an M17 clone, pretty much. There's some differences with the voice diaphragm and all stuff like that, but it's primarily an M17. Now... This isn't an awful mask as masks go. Um, I mean, it's a cheek filter mask and it has all the flaws of cheek filter masks, but it's not totally awful. The quality control on it's fairly good, so that's not an issue, which will be an issue when we get to the GSR. But from what I know, these masks are fairly good. Now, you'll know I, when I did put my M10 together, not this one, the regular M10, I had a rant and I got angry, but that was mostly just from the frustration of putting cheek filters in and then finding out those filters had long since expired and didn't even work. Um, but the M10 in theory as well is a good mask if the cheek filters were in date for it and you didn't have to suffer through the agony of putting cheek filters into the mask. So, cheek filter masks. What's the problem with them? Well, um, at the concept level, cheek filter masks were meant to be far more lightweight and compact than masks with canisters on them. And the idea was that soldiers wouldn't have to carry around a really heavy annoying mask because the filters would be on both sides so you could breathe easier and they'd be in the cheeks of the mask. The issue is that if you look at the size of this thing, it's pretty bulky, isn't it? And this was the problem all cheek filter masks basically ended up having was that apart from the XM28 and to a degree the PBF, they ended up being very bulky and very heavy compared to what they were originally meant to be. So you ended up actually having masks that were often heavier than the generation before them um, and probably bulkier. Now, again, you might say it's more convenient having a mask like this than having um, a big canister in your satchel with a hose, but bear in mind when the USM9 mask came out, which was one of the most popular masks in the world when it came out, probably one of the biggest breakthroughs in mask design in my opinion, they kind of squandered a lot of that with the M17. So. If you think of what the XM28 is, and think, I think that's what they basically had in mind when they came up with cheek filter masks, something really lightweight and convenient that you could just keep in a bag somewhere and forget about until you needed it, you ended up coming up with this. Now, cheek filter masks, in my opinion, could have been salvaged if the filters somehow connected to the outside. So you still have this pork chop shake fil uh, uh, pork chopped shaped filter that you can see that's sort of its roughly dimensions where it sits in there. But the idea would be that it would actually be on the outside, so the mask would be thinner here and then they'd connect on the outside. And that way you could put the filters on and off easily and put them on and replace them without compromising the mask and, you know, you could do it from the outside. Sadly with cheek filter masks, as we know, they decided to make a really awkward filter that went in each side of the mask. And they, each of these filters supposedly didn't last very long. I think six hours was the M17 estimate, which again is enough time if you can easily evacuate from an area, but if you're cut off and then you're gassed, uh, you've got a bit of a problem where you then have less than six hours to break through the enemy lines or you're all dead. Whereas if you have um, a 40mm or 60mm mask, the good thing is you can at least have spare filters, assuming you're issued with them, because if you've got one of those masks and you're not issued spare filters, they don't have that many advantages over a cheek filter mask, but if you do have the spare filters, they have at least got advantages. So, as I said, the problem with these is they're bulky and heavy, so I'll just put it on for you quickly. So, as you can see, when it's on my head, it is really, really bulky, particularly how far forward it sits on the face. Bear in mind, from a side profile, a regular mask doesn't sit that much more forward to your face. It's just got a canister on one side. This thing, however, obviously is fairly heavy, where you can always feel it pulling down on your face like that, putting pressure on the nose. Of course, I could tighten it up a bit more there, but... The issue is, you know, you've still got a heavy, cumbersome mask on your face, so the advantages you actually get from having two filters allowing you to breathe a bit earlier are quickly negated by this. And each of the filters allows less airflow than one 60mm filter or one 40mm filter. So you have the issue that, of course, once you're breathing with it on it, it does become much harder, because 
two filters added together aren't really any better, and when you've got all this weight on your head that's making you heat up quite quickly, um, suddenly this isn't a very fun mask to wear. Now, in terms of comfort, other than that, it's not too bad, but it's not brilliant, as I said. So, there we go, that's the M10. Now, the straps aren't as easy to get off as I remember them being. Um, they're not threading through as easy as they were, they're not too bad now I've taken it off, but still, you know, as I was saying, this mask is definitely one that, in concept, it sounds amazing. Oh, there's the inside for those of you who want to see the inside of the mask, because I always get asked that in videos. You won't see it all that particularly well, but the cheek filter masks were basically, in concept, they sounded great. Um, a lighter weight mask you could forget about. However, once, obviously, you came to do them, you're going to hate putting the filters in these things. Um, another problem is, when you've got the mask stored in your bag, the filters are going to constantly be expiring when they're exposed to things. So, when you come to actually put the mask on, you probably don't even have anywhere close to that six hours that was planned. Now, I know people have said, oh, but there were covers for these, so the cheek filters would have been totally covered, like little plastic covers. Not every mask was issued with those, so that's kind of a problem, because it doesn't matter in theory if something exists that makes your mask last longer. If you don't actually get that stuff, that's not great. Okay, so the Scott GSR. So, many of you know I've already done lots of videos moaning about this. This was the mask in the British Armed Forces that replaced the S10, for the most part. From what I've read, the SAS used the FM12 or CT12, um, and some other divisions of police and stuff like that. Well, because I know police aren't armed forces, but the reason I'm bringing this up is because people claim they are otherwise. Um, the police um, use FM12s as well, I believe. So, most, most of the armed forces, as far as I'm aware, RAF, Navy and Army all went to this. So, this is, again, it's the M17 problem, it's a cheek filter problem, it's pretty much like the spectre of the cheek filter masks has come back from the dead. Now, in concept, this is brilliant, right? It's, ba well, it's basically just a cheaper M Avon M50, but the Avon M50 is brilliant in concept. I don't have one, so I can't see if it totally holds up, but from everything I know about it, the idea was that because it's a bit dodgy, maybe, changing a 40mm filter, because you risk some stuff getting into the mask when you change the filter, you have the system that locks air off when you change the filter, so you have to have the filters on to be able to breathe. But again, this comes up with that M17 style problem of each of the filters is harder to breathe through because of a restricted access airflow due to the locking system. So, that's not great. Also, notice the size of the filters on this. These are really big. Um, Size-wise, these aren't too different from RD40 filters, 40mm NATO filters. Um, and you've got one on each side of the mask, and it's recommended to use the mask with both filters on. Although you don't have to, that's recommended, and in the British Army I think that is policy that you do have to do it. Um, so you've got a bit of a problem because you've got a mask that's a lot wider, and from the front it's not exactly slim either, it's a bit bulkier than a lot of 40mm masks. So again, the dimensions are bigger, and it's heavier again. It's about a kilo, I think, this mask, if I remember, just over a kilo, and there's a bit I've taken out of it that adds a bit of additional weight, that doesn't really serve any purpose, there's a weird particulate filter thing that sits on the chin of this mask for no reason. Um, now, one of the other issues of this was quality control. Um, lots of people reported in the British Army when they got these masks that there were bits falling out of them, rips in the rubber and stuff like that. A respirator is needed to save your life. If there's rips in it or it's falling apart, it is not fit for service. I don't care how cool it looks, it's not good enough. So, there were lots of problems with things like that, um, where people were finding, or soldiers were finding, where the S10 was fine, this was bringing up lots of problems. So again, in concept, this sounds brilliant. You have this special filter system that lets you, um, you know, have the filter on either side you want, um, breathe easier in theory, um, and, you know, you can lock the mask off so bad stuff can't get in if you need to do a filter change. However, in reality, it's not really the case. You end up having something much heavier, much bulkier than an S10. I mean, look at the size of the satchel. One thing I've read, and obviously I can't verify, is that the paras hate this mask, because you can't actually properly do a para drop with it, and if you do, you can break the mask, and, you know, all sorts of problems like that. So again, why did the S10 need replacing for that? Or if you are going to replace the S10, at least replace it with an M50, or a more modular, you know, better modern mask. Um, another issue I've moaned about with this loads of times, and maybe I will eventually do a video showing this, under this bayonet system is the 40mm uh, thing, so it's not this unique thing attaches directly to the mask. Oh no, you've got your 40mm bit hidden under here. So basically, 
you have one system to then have a converter for another system. So, again, that adds weight and restricts airflow where it's not needed and adds bulk. Um, I'm sure if they made this mask attach these filters directly rather than using that system, they could have probably cut the size down a bit and weight um, and made it altogether more practical. The head strap isn't bad for it, to be honest. I like that. Uh, it's really uncomfortable on the chin for some reason. I don't know why. I found if I put my face further into it than I should, it's actually a lot more comfortable. Um, not that you'd really want to do that in an NBC scenario. Also, it's got your modern, we've glued the lens in thing, which isn't a good idea on a respirator, especially when there's blister agents. So, again, they've done that weird rubber welding process around there that's sort of cracking already, which I wouldn't trust. So, basically, in concept, this is again meant to be like a lightweight slimline mask that you can wear for longer and it's less of a problem. In reality, uh, you don't get much more airflow than something like an S10. The added weight means that you're going to actually need more airflow. And altogether, it's not all that comfortable or brilliant. So, let's put it on anyway. So, what I'm going to do is just get on as best I can. And pull my chin into it there so it's a bit more comfortable. <clears throat> but you can probably see again the, how bulky this is now it's on me. So it's not a totally awful mark. <laughs> I really don't like it. But I mean, I can see in concept it being quite good if the quality control was better. But then that would be an Avon M50, I guess. Another point to mention as well is it's harder to get a sight picture of this on than it is with an S10 or a lot of other masks. So although you've got the panoramic lens, you don't massively benefit from having it. So, yeah, it seems to be pressurising, but as said, much better at the concept level than it was in reality. I suppose what it was meant to be was an Avon M50, which it clearly isn't.